Hi, I'm AP Townley, and this is Role Play Culture. All right, Rambo, we're going in. <laughs> it's by no means strange to play in D&D, and for 90% of your sessions to be nothing but fart and dick jokes, slapstick comedy, off-the-cuff one-liners, and many, many bad choices by the players. It's like my old DM used to say, and still does say, DMs don't kill players, players kill players. And that is still a monumental amount of fun. I mean, just watch Critical Role or their animated show, Legends of Vox Machina. Those idiots can barely tie their shoelaces, much less save the world. But somehow, they still manage it anyway. There's something charming about playing an incompetent character, stumbling their way through the adventure with all their flaws and problems on display. It's easy to connect with a character like that because well, they're basically us. But sometimes, just sometimes, we want the opposite. A hyper-competent adventurer that's ready for any mission, handle any problem. John Rambo, John Wick, or my personal favorite, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character from the film Commando. John Matrix. Yep, that's my favorite of the Johns. So I present episode 5 of the series Level Up, The Commando. Let's start with the background. It really gets this character going in the right direction. We'll take Ruined from the new Book of Many Things. Maybe we were captured and suffered as a POW before enacting a daring escape. Or lost our entire squad to an ambush before we went on a solitary spree of revenge. We'll get the skills Stealth and Survival, two of the three most important skills for any individual carrying out asymmetric warfare. We need to be able to stay hidden and stay alive in the wilderness. We'll get a language and a gaming set, and pick your favorites. And finally, we get the feature Still Standing. We get a choice of a feat from three options. All three are great, but I think the Alert feat serves us best. It means we can't be surprised as long as we're conscious nor do enemies have an advantage on attack rolls just because we can't see them, and we get a plus five to our initiative. So we're not going to be surprised. We're taking advantage of in an ambush, and we're almost certainly going to go first in combat. That's a start. If your DM doesn't like this background, as it is one of the stronger ones that provides a feat, you can choose soldier or even marine, which would be pretty cool. For stats, a 15 in dex and a 14 in constitution and wisdom, I'd probably go with a 10 in strength as well. You want to be able to have an okay athletics check. You'd be able to at least have the possibility of getting out of grapples. You know, soldier stuff. For species, custom lineage. Yeah, I know, I know. But it serves its purpose. It gives us a plus two to any ability score. We'll add that to dex, making it a 17. Pick an extra language, PYF. We get the choice of a skill or dark vision. We'll get dark vision in another way. So let's take intimidation. Our special forces training taught us some interrogation techniques. It gives us something to do in, out of combat and in social situations. And finally, we get another feat. You might be tempted to have your DM already pulling their hair out at level one with sharpshooter, but patience, patience. Instead, let's go with piercer. I think sharpshooter's minus five to penalty is hard to deal with so early in the levels. Piercer will give us better all around results. It also rounds out our dexterity to 18, once per round, when we do piercing damage. And everything we will do, it will be piercing damage. We can reroll one of the damage die and use the new result. And soon, we'll have plenty of dice to choose from. Also, when we crit with a weapon that does piercing damage, we can add another die to the total result. For example, if we crit using a longbow, instead of doing 2d8 damage, we can do 3d8 damage. There's no limit to how many times you can use these abilities as long as you meet these conditions. You can use them often as you want. As for class, we gotta go with Ranger. No other class exemplifies a special operator like the Ranger does. D10 hit die, martial weapon proficiency, up to medium armor, proficiency in strength and deck saving throws, and we start with three skills. Perception is a must. Strongest skill in the game, as the group's scout and spotter, we have to have it. Insight serves us in social situations, 
as well, and we have a decent wisdom to support it. And the athletics, so our ability to climb, swim, and other physical activities will have some chance of succeeding. For equipment, choose gold by, get a longbow, arrows, two short swords for backup, and studded leather armor if you can afford it. This will give us an AC of 16, not too bad for an archer at first level. The optional favorite foe says when we hit an enemy with an attack, we mark them for one minute, or until we lose concentration, as if it were a spell. The first time we hit them in a turn, we do an extra 1d4 damage to them. So it's like a lesser hunter's mark. But it doesn't require our bonus action. We can use this feature proficiency times per day. The canny feature from Deft Explorer gives us two more languages. Pick the ones that best suit your campaign. We also get to double the proficiency bonus to one of our skills. I'd say go with perception so we always know what's coming at us. Second level gives us a fighting style, which of course we're going to take archery, giving us a plus two to our ranged weapon attacks. We also get two first level spell slots and learn two spells. I'd suggest absorb elements for defense, having incoming elemental damage with a reaction. Also, if we resort to using our short swords, which you know, we're pretty good with too, we can add an additional 1d6 of the elemental damage that we just had. Snare is one of the most underrated spells in my opinion, but it's a great ambush spell. And that is just so commando, isn't it? This spell lasts for eight hours. So you can set it up well before an ambush you've planned out. It lays an invisible trap that hoists the afflicted into the air. If you have a spell slots left over for the day before a long rest, it would also be a great way to protect your camp. Third level, we learn another spell and get another spell slot. I suggest Zephyr Strike. This is a bonus action spell that allows you to move without provoking attacks opportunity, gives one attack advantage, and does an extra 1d8 force damage. And when you do make this attack, your speed increases by 30 feet. As an archer, this spell can get us out of melee, which is death to us. It lets us lay down some serious hurt on the offenders. We'll use the optional primeval awareness and learn speak with animals, which does what, pretty much what it says. And we can cast this once per day without a spell slot and of course with our own spell slots. It's just a good staple ranger ability. And we'll get more spells like this as we level up. We also choose our subclass, and we get to go with Gloomstalker. It's just perfect. We learn another spell, Disguise Self, that we can give us some infiltration abilities. We get Umbral Sight, which gives us dark vision of 60 feet. So finally, we have our thermal night vision. But we also get some thermal camo, too. We are invisible to those using dark vision to see us. And remember, you get advantage on attack rolls against anyone that can't see you. So keep that in mind. Then there's Dread Ambusher, which allows us to add our Wisdom modifier, which is plus two at this point, to our initiative. That means our initiative bonus at this moment is plus 11. Dang! No one's getting one over on us. Dread Ambusher also lets us, on the first turn of combat, increase our speed by 10 feet and make one extra attack with an attack action that will do an additional 1d8 damage. A very first strike ability. Fourth level gives us a feat, which, big surprise, I know, we're taking Sharpshooter, which allows us to take a minus 5 to attack and give us plus 10 to damage on any attack we make with a, with a ranged weapon. With the archery fighting style and the ability to give ourselves advantage on attacks, either with Zephyr Strike or with the Umbral Sight ability, we will be able to offset the, pen the penalty pretty reliably. In addition, we can use the 600 foot range of the longbow without penalty, which is really far, as well as ignore half and three quarters cover, which will really help ensure we land our attacks even more. Now, let's take a moment and see what combat looks like for the commando. The finesse of this character is more in setting up the combat than the combat itself. Using stealth and umbral sight, we set ambushes and surprise attacks beforehand, along with maybe setting up some snare traps, maybe even some humpty traps so we can get our hands on them. And then combat's pretty simple. Look for the most important or meanest enemy and kill it until it's dead. Get advantage on your attacks, either through not being seen or Zephyr Strike, 
use your favorite foe if possible, but it won't stack with Zephyr Strike, unfortunately. Stack on as much damage as possible with Dread Ambusher, re-rolling any dice that we can with a Piercer Feet, with Zephyr Strike and Dread Ambusher. The first round of combat, we would attack with advantage and do 3d8 plus 14 damage. And we can re-roll one of those die if we want. From there, we just keep moving away from melee combatants and shoot everything in sight. If we had to, we do have two, two short swords that do still benefit from the piercer feet to engage those stubborn enemies. Fifth level gives us extra attack, allowing us to make two attacks per turn. We also get an extra first level spell slot, along with two new second level spell slots. From primeval awareness, we learn beast sense, which lets us share senses with an animal. Niche, but you know, it could be useful. Clue Soccer gives us Rope Trick, which can let us hide our entire party in an invisible extra dimensional space for an hour. Great for setting up an ambush. We get one choice of our own. There are a bunch of good ones, but I'm going to go with Cordon of Arrows. It's one of those hated spells that I secretly love. This spell lasts for eight hours. It sets up four pieces of ammunition that will automatically attack those that come near it. Also great for setting up an ambush, and should you have any leftover spell slots, at the end of the day, this spell can also protect your camp while you sleep. Snare and Cordon of Arrows synergize pretty well together with Cordon of Arrows allowing a dex save, but those caught in Snare have disadvantage on those saves. Also, at this level, your proficiency goes up to plus three. Sixth level is where we diverge and start picking up levels of Rogue. Ranger and Rogue always go well together. First level Rogue is going to give us proficiency with these tools, a very useful thing to have, and one additional skill. It might take sleight of hand as we become a little more covert operative along with Man Commando. Remember, for multi-classing, you need at least a 13 in Dex for both the Ranger and the Rogue, as well as a 13 in Wisdom for the Ranger, which is not going to be a problem for us, though. We learned these can't, which is a secret code buried in normal conversation. I imagine this is like military jargon for this character. We get expertise in two skills. This lets us add double our proficiency, so it'll be a plus six. We already sort of have this before perception, so I say we choose stealth as staying hidden and sneaking up on enemies is very important for this character. For the other, we'll choose an option unique to the road and have expertise with thieves tools. It's not a skill, but as rogues, we can choose that specifically. This will supercharge our new infiltrator persona. We also get sneak attack at this level, 1d6. Once per turn, we can do extra damage to a target with a finesse or ranged weapon, which won't be a problem for us. If we have advantage on the attack, which we're pretty good at, or if an ally is within five feet of them. This is just stacking even more damage on our already monstrous first turn. Second level of Rogue gives Cunning Action, which allows us to use a bonus action to dash, disengage, or hide. So you can quickly get away, get into a better position to fire, or unload a lot of hurt on someone. Or move and then hide all in the same turn. And now your mastery in ambushing is complete, and your DM will hate you forever. Sorry, not sorry. Third level gives us an increased sneak attack, 2d6. We also get steady aim, which lets us use a bonus action on our next attack at the cost of our movement to get advantage. Probably only use that in emergencies. But we get our subclass at this level, and though I am tempted to take scout, which I think is probably the better rounded option, I can't ignore the allure of assassin. I actually don't like this subclass very much, which we'll discuss in a second. But we're going to choose it anyway. We get proficiency with a disguise kit and poisoner's kit, which further enhances our infiltration abilities as well as giving us the ability to make and use poisons. A vial of basic poison, which can do an extra 1d4 poison damage on a fail save, can coat three pieces of ammunition. And this character can make three attacks on the first round of combat. Convenient, yes? And then we come to the meat, the assassinate feature. We have advantage on attacks against opponents that haven't gone in combat yet. And if we hit on an enemy that is surprised, each blow is a critical. 
Now, my issue with this ability is that if you roll poorly on initiative, even if your enemy is surprised, they can still go for you. They won't be able to take their turn, but they won't be surprised anymore afterwards. And then you can't assassinate them. And, you know, achieving surprise you know, has its own challenges. However, if there was any character build that could ensure surprise and reliably win initiative, it's this one. Because when it does work, it's amazing. We are very good at stealth and essentially invisible to creatures using dark vision. So getting surprise should be achievable. And our initiative modifier is plus 11, which is ridiculous. Going first is not going to be a problem. On the first round of combat, assuming we have poisoned our arrows and used favored foe, our first attack is at advantage and does 5d8 plus 46 plus 44 plus 14 points of damage. And that is 60.5 points of damage on the first round. Piercer lets us reroll one of those damage dice, so the average is even higher. We have two more attacks after that, which will also be criticals. That is well over a hundred points of damage, and you are going to kill whatever you target. For level nine, we are going to revisit our soldier roots. These are taking levels from fighter, which is easy as we only need a 13 dexterity. First level in fighter gives us another fighting style. You can get fancy with this, but I'm just going to keep it simple and just take defensive style, which gives us a plus one in AC, making it a 17. Our AC is not terrible, but it could use a little help. We also get second wind at this level, which allows us to use a bonus action to heal for 1d10 plus our fighter level in hit points. Recharges on a short rest. So this will give us you know, a little bit of minor healing in a pinch. But fighter two is where it's at with action surge. Once per short rest, we can take an additional action. Full action. You can cast a spell if you wanted, even if you've already done that. You can make attacks, and remember, it's all of your attacks, and depending on how you interpret the wording of Dread Ambusher, you should be able to get that extra attack with the bonus to damage, even if you already used it. That's six attacks. Ma'am, the Beholder is dead. And with that, I think we'll end the build there, as it accomplishes everything it's trying to do. If you wanted to continue it, I'd probably take it one more level of fighter to pick up a subclass, probably Battlemaster. And then I go back to Rogue for the rest of the adventure. Let's discuss magic items. Magic Longbow is a must. Certainly a plus one, two, or three weapon fits the bill. Maybe it will give us three resistances, but that's kind of boring. A weapon of warning is more interesting. It will awaken you and your companions if combat begins, and it will keep your companions from being surprised. Oh, and you have advantage on initiative checks. As if our initiative wasn't crazy enough already. An oath bow would be cool too, you know, if a DM was dumb enough to give it to us. And Cloak of Elvenkind would not go amiss. It give perception checks to notice us disadvantage, and our stealth checks advantage. Yeah, we're basically going to be, you know, this. Just remember, magic items are usually not chosen, but found. So don't bug your DM too much about it. I actually think regular equipments like hunting traps and poisons are more useful and a better use of your time and resources. So for some advice for DMs on this, I'm not gonna lie, this one might be a bit of a problem. This character's first direct abilities are out of this world. If you have a BBEG that's alone, this, this character is just gonna annihilate them. So I would suggest for groups of enemies at least, don't make the orc shaman look any different than any of the other orcs, at least until you start casting spells. And for any enemy with a modicum of intelligence, after the commandos for a strike, they would either flee or try and close the distance and disrupt the player's abilities. And for the big bad guys, well, this character is why Simulacrum actually exists, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and in the video, we need to give our commando a name. And I think it's obvious by now. But John will do nicely. Please subscribe, smash that like button, ring the bell. Check out you know, some of these other videos. Tell us in the comments below how you would build the commando. And for God's sake, don't hurt the dog.